We are here with one of the legends of the industry, which is Hala Matar Shufani, which is, she's the queen <laughs> of hospitality, consulting and investment. Right? Is, Filippo, is that correct? I know the strategy. <laughs> you always... What? Embarrass me in the beginning. No, I'm humbled no. by this introduction, but he does it all the time. No, it is. It is. <laughs> Thank you. We need to give what belongs to, to the people. So it belongs Thank to you. you, this title. Thank and, you. And um, the reason for us to uh, coming together is to grow a collaboration into a very important topic, a topic that is in the shadow and almost defined as the best kept secret, which is the capex and the context in the overall return on investment, let's say, and how impactful is this topic for the whole industry, uh, everywhere, not just in our region. And uh, so what a better occasion to have two people that are passionate about what they do. And uh, Absolutely. And uh, we can say yeah. we know what we're talking about. Exactly. I think collectively we must have looked at 10,000 assets, to say the least. At right? least. At least. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, I'm always curious about um, what people get together. And, um, and, uh, and for us, it was very much, you know, you see the problem up front. You enter to the project, you know, feasibilities, operator selections, valuations, you know all a whole range of services. So you see the problem at the very early stages. And uh, we come in much later, execution stage, where the FFE is probably the single cause of uh, hotel project delay because it's very misunderstood as a process, as a category, as a role that a manufacturer has in the overall process. And, um, but, why for you is important this collaboration? Yeah, I think uh, Filippo, you've you've mentioned the best kept secret, right? I would probably say this is one of the most painful exercises, and that is where I would start off by talking about this collaboration because essentially, in any work we're doing, right, we're trying to the best of our abilities, and mm -hmm. we always stress the best of our abilities, considering the volatility and the fluctuation and the the dynamics of our industry to really be be able to put forward a reasonable estimate of what an investment could look like and what the potential returns of this investment. And this has been an area, and I know that you've been once upon a time wearing my hat and you have gone through the process of trying to determine how are we looking at these projects, feasibilities and the IRR and what are the pieces that we really need to get more comfortable with. And with time, we're building those databases, but today, we still have to understand what is OSNE, what is FFNE, what is the capital expenditure, and how do they differ depending on the projects, and how are they really impacting the feasibility of a project. So as much as I'd love to believe that we have extensive experience in the projects that we're working on, what is extremely essential is also getting a, a relatively reasonable cost estimate that at the time of even execution, given the time elapsed between when we look at the feasibility of the project and the actual execution, as to whether we are able to quantify the capital expenditure, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to the FFNE and OSNE. And we, we can discuss this further, but this is not the biggest chunk of the investment cost, but it is quite a chunk of how much you spend and the potential impact on the IRR. And that's why I think if we are able, as in HVS, in our experience in working on producing the potential inflows, I would say, of a project, and then collaborate with you based on your experience and your hands-on, I would say, experience in actually delivering on projects either that are in the pipeline or on refurbishment projects or conversion projects to really get a better understanding what is required in terms of investment, how are we spending it, and what is the ultimate impact on the IRR. That could only further strengthen the feasibility studies or any other type of financial advisory work that we're doing for our clients. What is interesting is that 
as you're saying, once upon a time, I used to wear the same hat, and uh, now I'm on this side of the fence. And um, I would say that uh, between the role of a consultant or the one that determines the investment parameters, which is exactly what we do as consultant is investment parameters. You tell them exactly how much money they're going to make based on the money they put in. And us, that we are at the other end when it comes to execute and manufacture, you know, the, there is an invisible line between us, mm. which is called design. Right. And, and, and that invisible line, which is part of the process, is, I think, the bridge between the two sides of the fence, you know, you know of, of the two parts of the process, because you clearly, you know, I mean, or the, the investment advisor role, the, the consultant role, is to determine clear parameters of how you're achieving a goal or making that kind of money. The design is to bridge a gap of the physical world. And then right. we come in need to execute what they're saying. But it's funny because nine out of 10 clients, they claim I don't have a budget. Yeah. Nine out of ten. And you have a very clear feasibility, very right. detailed. Yeah. And I know you yeah, want yeah, super absolutely. details. There's no budget. Then the interior designer, because it's more relevant to my world, let's not talk about the other category, they don't have a budget. So my question is, how can these people eventually try to deliver what you've been advising them from the very beginning if they don't follow the, the initial advice, which is the advice right. you gave them? Yeah. And then we come into us and then we have to execute in time frame, which is totally misunderstood. So again, not understanding the process, they, they basically, again, they don't follow what you said at the very beginning, the parameters. So again, time is money. So the, the dynamic changes. There is a lack of understanding of what does it mean delivering an FFE, which is the dress of the hotel. It is what makes or breaks your image, right. your storytelling. Absolutely. And so there is a, a, it's very misunderstood. And that's why this collaboration is very important. The, shedding light and giving people a practical advice, a pragmatic yeah. advice to say, hey, this is what it was at the beginning, if it is a, a new hotel, and this is what it's going to be now, based on the fact that in between these two worlds, there is a, there is, a yeah. process called design. Absolutely. It makes or breaks what you've been yeah. told and, and what you need to complete this process. And then, uh, you know, or for existing asset is clearly how much money do I need really to invest to, to elevate to the next level, to reposition? And, uh, and, but from a very practical point of view, because you see yeah. the real numbers, you do tons of valuations. So the real numbers, not even benchmark, real numbers, so real money. And we are the back end, so we know exactly how much it costs because we're making it. So it's, 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 a, it's a tangible approach, yeah. not a benchmark or an estimate. So, we get in there. Now, considering that in this region, you know, I mean, uh, you, you, you touch every market. You know, I don't think there's a market that has been untouched from you. How, where do you see the challenges nowadays on this topic in executing feasibility or giving advice to clients? I think, Filippo, you really nailed the process right. And uh, probably this is where, uh, you know, going back to the 101 of any feasibility study. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're, we're studying the opportunity. It starts as an opportunity. We identify the opportunity. And when we identify the opportunity, there's two objectives in mind. To confirm if there is an opportunity to build and how big and how much. But more importantly, to also confirm the positioning of the asset based on the demand and supply dynamics of that market. But also, more importantly, is to confirm or advise on the maximum efficiency. And what we're observing now, and I think you can definitely relate to that, I mean, even the hospitality industry or the hotel asset is being perceived more of a real estate product because of the market dynamics. So the objective at the moment is how do we maximize every square meter? And I know this discussion is extremely important going back to what you're doing at the moment, because if we are building more square meters, we need to furnish and fit out 
additional space, right? So at the very start of any engagement, as a feasibility study, we need to determine positioning and investment. And investment takes into account your BUA, takes into account, to some extent, clearly your operator and brand standards. But more importantly is, are you able to deliver on that positioning from a look and feel? And that's where design and the fit out comes into play to be able to achieve or to be able to position the asset. When the actual developer or client goes to execution, the biggest challenge, to your point, the biggest challenge is, are these estimates of costs reasonable? Have they been underestimated or are they exaggerated? At times, exaggeration comes because of market dynamics, which is such as these current circumstances with higher inflation, higher cost for sourcing and shipping, or is it because we are over-specifying? And that is another problem because you know too well, if you're doing a mid-scale property, you know exactly how much should be spent, what furniture is required, how much should be spent in order not to penalize the returns of a project. Now, I wanna to touch on something you mentioned, and I'm not attacking the design people. I love them. Of course. I, I'm in love with design. But what we also see that oftentimes the briefing that goes out from a design perspective, it comes back not necessarily reflective of the potential of the asset. I mean, there are amazing designs out there, but some of them are very expensive, as I'm sure you're going to agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. So to execute on any design, yeah, sky is the limit with regards to what you're trying to achieve. But in reality, you're always constrained by the income potential of an asset once built and that goes back to what you know what you were talking about you have hard facts to actually say for such a positioning or such an asset based on a certain feasibility study that's how much you can spend S somehow this is limiting but it all depends also on the creativity as to how you spend the fit out right how exactly. you're sourcing it and yes. i think you can talk more about this and i this is where the edge that you bring into this discussion can we actually deliver, but perhaps at a lower cost than what is oftentimes estimated in those budgets? And I'm sure there are clear examples as to where you have been called in to put a budget that came like for like 50% lower than someone else who's submitted the same budget. Of course. Yeah. There is. I'd love, I'd, there. I'm poking you. No, yeah. I'm poking no, you no, because I'm ready, a, I know you're ready to share some of those no, stories, no, it, right? It's, a, it's very interesting. And um, uh, we've been publishing the FFE market index demand reports for about a year and a half now. And, uh, and we track about one and a half million rooms worldwide. Okay. The data is supplied by the Topotal project, THP now. And, uh, and we tried, and it's broken down for five star, divided into ultra luxury, luxury, and business luxury. And then uh, four star, or let's say more, you know, upper upscale, into resort and urban hotels. And uh, the numbers are incredible, but they're real numbers because the, each room of the one and a half million have been analyzed of what brand they belong to and the sizes of this base module. So. To start with, I think it's very important for people to understand that the numbers that a consultant put in a feasibility study are necessary to set a parameter of a budget, right. which is normally benchmark is cost per key. But the first question is, how big is that key? Right. When you put together the base module and all the other facilities. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Is it a 100 square meter yeah. per key or is it a 50 square meter per key? Exactly. And are we wasting 30 square meters that we don't necessarily need to build? Because if Very you build much. it, you have to furnish it. True. Right? This is point number one. Point number two, you have the like for like. So you've got two ultra luxury brands that have the same base module, whether it's 50, 55, 60 square meter on the base module. But then the issue comes when the design put too many pieces inside mm -hmm. the room. So, and then, uh, so I aesthetics over functionality. Right. So it's more a look and feel as opposed, yeah, it's great, it's in line with the brand standard, with the brand positioning, but too many pieces. So the first question is, do we need, need though, from Absolutely. an operational point of Absolutely. view? So although we are manufacturing, but we need to think about it. And uh, this Let is- Let alone advice. the cleaning of that. 
Because that much. touch that touch the running costs as well, oftentimes yeah. which goes unmissed when you have to. Hundred yeah. percent. The 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 time it takes to clean a room, right. the, maintenance the maintenance of a room. So it will add to the uh, fixed and variable cost of a hotel yeah. uh, running cost. So that is the first point. Then, when you estimating professional fees as part of that, is always a blend. You never go extreme. You know, I mean, I'm assuming the cheapest consultant, I'm assuming the star architect. Right. It's, it's you a blend. take somewhere in between. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but that it goes very well. If you own a star architect, the fact that come with a cost. And um, a lot of people uh, underestimate the fact that, you know, the briefing is not right. So what, what your story telling about this hotel, yeah. how you position it against any other deluxe property, any other lifestyle property. Why that is important? Because the look and feel of the hotel determine also how much money you need to spend on this hotel. Absolutely. You know, again, it's, uh, it depends on the material. Uh, another technicality that comes down to budget is that benchmarking per key is for an investment purpose or quantity surveying their benchmarking is per square meter. Now, in the FFE business, everything is, anything is hard surfaces is cubic meter. So volumetric yeah. element. Anything that is textile is either line meters or square yards for leather. So there is an imbalance between the two worlds, but it's not an imbalance. It's that the one world operate in a certain manner. When Correct. it comes to execution, the raw material yeah. is a different you business. You have to go into a very detailed... So, uh, this is view, where, yeah. when I was in consultancy, people don't do updates of the feasibility study, and they should do a regular Absolutely. update to get, and get the real numbers yeah. based on the design, because it all go down there. Um, so this is the, the kind of interesting art facts that come out. But the most important one is that the... The development real estate world don't realize that uh, in a normal hotel, um, the typical procurement strategy the people in, engage encompass the likes of 28, 29 suppliers, seven to eight countries, five time zones. So already the way the procurement strategy is done mm. from the developers set them on, 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 on on an area that you, you're going to be delayed. Whether you like it or not, is yeah. that because it makes no sense. The coordination, the communication with this Absolutely. is wrong. Yeah. A manufacturer-led approach is you have a manufacturer that knows exactly the time frame, knows exactly Delivery the material. Dates, yeah. How long does it take to make one thing? How long does it take to deliver that? So, and what is impact from the operations? So, dining tables, there are, or coffee tables. There are coffee tables that are 150 kilo. How can you move that coffee yeah. table from an oh, operation? And, and there are so many examples of that. I mean, yes. you touched on one yes. of those typical examples that they look extremely nice, but then you can't do, you can't move them. Yeah. You can't do anything with that furniture. Probably costs exactly also a lot right. of money, right? Huge, huge amount of money, yeah. but unnecessary yeah. because, um, you know, from a practicality point of view, you don't need that type of furniture in that context, you know, or putting you know, certain type of material in an F&B area, a lot of stains, you know, uh, coffee marks on marble tables because the quality is not right. Yeah, you save $100 today, you lose losing 2000 right. tomorrow. Absolutely. You know, again, but they don't take into account that the wrong material takes time to clean, maintenance. So you add in payroll costs. You add in extraordinary expenses, never forecasted. You don't know you need to buy a product now to clean your tables right, yeah. or repair them. So, But I mean, sometimes also it's interesting to, to I mean, I, I, a question comes to mind as we have this conversation. Those that are actually the procurement team, how knowledgeable are they about the operations of hotels? I mean, as we are describing mm -hmm. it today, because I think, you know, you make those decisions at a very early stage, but operationally, some of those decisions are the wrong decisions that cost a lot of money in operations. And perhaps this is where I think, for instance, specifically you, uh, Filippo, coming from the background where you understand hotel operations, where you understand hotel consulting, and you're coming forward to actually now provide a, a package, a furniture package, you can make those arguments, right? 
that this makes more sense because these are the potential savings. Or if, if you were to opt for such a design or such a product or such a finishing, these are potentially where it's going to entail additional expenditure. Yes. Right? So, I mean, there are a number of parties that are involved, very qualified to pass on the right advice. But you also have in that process and that cycle, those individuals, I don't want to say they're un not qualified, but they don't necessarily have the experience. I mean, again, we're talking here about a hospitality industry that is so different in many ways, including the wear and tear of this product, which I think is what you are also trying to get at. So I'm, I'm actually interested to hear from you with all the discussions you've been having, whether on existing assets, on potential you know, proposed assets, where where is the pushback or where are the opportunity? What are the challenges? How are the developers and owners looking specifically at that piece? And as you said earlier on, and we see it all the time, right? There is a budget, there is an overspending in the what I call the heart structure. I think we all use the same terminology. But then you get to the actual finishing of the project. That's where the look and feel, that's where the storytelling is. That's where you're gonna have people walk in and feel this is warm versus this is cold. And that's what oftentimes results yeah. in success or in failure. We do see at least 60, 70% of those projects, at that point in time, they've run out of budget. So what happens is a shortcut into the quality of the finishing, into potentially, whether it's the light bulbs, whether it's the mattress, whether it's other design elements that are extremely important. I'd love to understand a little bit more and perhaps all of those that are listening to us, um, what has been your experience, at least in this part of the world, with how the selection of FF&E is, where the opportunities are, where is the pushback? There is some, um, and it's interesting because, um, again, the, the feasibility in itself as a process set very clear parameters, which is, as you know better than anyone else, is a... Uh, they are, when you do a feasibility study based on a typology or on a position of hotel, whether it's luxury mid market up a scale, you only do a feasibility based on the market dynamics, but also you do it based on what kind of brand standard those or facilities, interactions or facility programming that kind of property need to have in that context based on that specific plot and so forth. But then when it comes to execution, there is a disconnection from what the parameter you set during the feasibility, which are very clear industry parameters on how to entertain hotel investment. And, and it's very clear, it's not that it's something new, it's something that's been studied for the past 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a proven methodology, it's a proven you know, uh, way of undertaking investment assessment. Then when it comes to the execution part, there is a total disconnection on that. And I go specific, the procurement process of a um, hotel asset in the context of FFE &E and OSE &E is completely obsolete. Yeah. Why? Because the procurement agent function a role was born back in the US to take care of the what is very much strictly linked to brand standard, which is OSE. &E. Clear brands of whether it's a crockery or whether it's uniform or whatever category it is, those are the core brand yeah. standard, yeah. the visible element that they are the same in every hotel, more or less. Right. But then, because this category is very much mandated, and this is what makes a brand, you know, the clear yeah. list of, so the undisputable. But there are many categories. So the procurement agency role at that time was to take care of so many categories of items that come from different parts of the world. So the administration part of this become very heavy. So a developer may not have such a big procurement team that can actually take care of all that, nor the expertise, yeah, in definitely. all fairness. Yeah. It's a totally different cut of it. A TV for the home is a different, it's different TV to that what you, you yeah. put in a hotel system and so forth. But then, Obviously, the convenience factor to say, hey, since these guys are doing the os &E, let me give them the ff &E. &E. The difference is that the ff &E is very technical, meaning you need to know the material, you need to know the impact that certain design has on the budget, on the functionality, on the operations of hotel. 
So they enter into a world that before is an Excel function. Right. And they want to apply the same Excel function into an FFE business. It don't work. Yeah. And why? And a very simple example, if this chair has the same finishes of this, or if this table wood is the same as the skirting board, and I buy this from that guy, and I buy that from that guy, how can the two color scheme match the skirting board? Yeah. Makes no sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, but it's an Excel function, so this is why things get horribly wrong. So the procurement strategy is so obsolete, and number one. Number two, and therefore, the parameter you set at the feasibility stage at the very beginning get completely destroyed because they fall on a different route. It's like saying you need to do an ultra luxury hotel and then you build an upper upscale, you don't achieve the average rate. Yeah, but it's a different car than yeah, a sports car. Absolutely. So you can't pretend to go that fast if you buy these kind of cars. So that is the first point. So whatever you set at the very beginning of the investment parameter, get completely tear apart during the process, which right. is, you're not responsible for, you're not even part yeah. of it. So in different capacity and so forth. Then the second part is the following, that a procurement person for a development company or for an organization cannot have a technical expertise to understand how much a, a, a design can cost. And the interaction of materials have uh, uh, for example, uh, a very simple example is the most, the simplest of all. Before the sustainability, before the animal activists start playing a big part in the whole ESG world, from the luxury handbags to hotel business, nobody would accept composite leather, wrongly called fake leather, as a, a substitute for real leather, yeah. cow leather. So they need to kill cows in order right. to make leather. So now because it's becoming part of the overall, you know, looking after the planet, looking after humanity, including the animals, now composite leather become, you know, a, an acceptable product. Right. And actually, the good part is the A is fire resistant, so you get certification. Mm -hmm. Real leather, you don't. you don't. So problem with the civil defense. But it was a point that it's been overcome, and uh, so it wasn't an issue. But what is the difference? The difference is that with the same, in the same chair, a real leather has 30 to 35 wastage because it comes very irregular yeah. and in square feet. Why composite leather comes in line meter, very simple 90 degree corners, all say people. There's only 15% wastage. So the same chair, you save because, money. Yeah, absolutely. So this is not having knowledge that a procurement person cannot have that kind of technical knowledge to advise the client. But even more, in order, I'm very comfortable to say that as a former consultant to say that if an owner brings in a manufacturer, independently of whether this manufacturer will be part of the tender process or get awarded the supply, but if you bring in a manufacturer at design stage, concept, schematic, and detail, and the role of the manufacturer, of a bespoke manufacturer, no people have catalogs because there's right. a difference, yeah. is to follow the design process and advise how much the material has yeah, been designed it, cost. Yeah. You end up at the end of the process, you know exactly whether you are within the feasibility budget or not. Because that's what it goes down to. But isn't it also common here, and I think you touched on that, what from an OSNE point of view, the brand standards. Because I, it, it, it's my uh, understanding as well that there are certain brand standards as well when it comes to FFNE. I'd like to always, you know, challenge some of the concepts that are out there. I mean, today with the development of the hotel industry, do we should we still call them brand standards? I mean, these are industry standards, right? I mean, yeah. when it, I mean, they're no longer brand standards because oftentimes... They're no unique. You, it, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of those budgets and we've got developers or even operators saying, yeah, but, you know, these are our brand standards. I mean, these are industry standards, whatever it is, okay. whether it is, you know, the the uh, five fixture bathroom or whether it is the lamp by the side or uh, the supplies that you have in the room. These have become industry standards. Now, what differentiates luxury from a four star is also very clear in terms of the fabric and the material and what you provide in the room so i think really trying to get at from an ffne standpoint as to how much as a developer or as an owner they have control over this 
vis-a-vis the operator from when it comes to yep. the actual costing. So that I think is something that we are also observing a pushback at the moment. And, and, and at least I can claim that operators are willing to also have this conversation that if the owner has access, just like what you were proposing, if they have their own manufacturer or that they are able to source as well from a different source than what typically is usually mandated, then there could potentially be a saving and potentially even better designs that are delivered, right? So I, I don't know if this is also a sense that you have established in the last couple of years, specifically as it relates to brand standards. The only part that can be called brand standard, that even at that level, is, is pretty much follow industry standard, is anything that concerns fire life safety. So the fire resistance level right. of yeah, materials, the durability of material, the Martindale of fabrics. So it means the durability and the strength of this but fabric. But that's again going back to industry standards, it right? Is. It's no longer brand standards. I think what I'm, I'm challenging when we it's talk about brand standards, standards because yes. is it the brand standards of that operator only? Well, not. No, very it much is. they're all the same. Yeah. It's uh, more or less, it's a, it can never be the same. I don't think it's a question that it, it just, um, you know, some brand standard, for example, for lounge uh, armchair, they tell you the depth, the height, and uh, and the width of a, of an armchair. How but, important, Filippo, is that? But <laughs> <laughs> no, common, putting you common on this sense, idea, right? I common mean, sense is more important. Yeah. Is what is really comfortable? Yeah. What matters? You know, I mean, uh, yeah. it depends. It depends on the average person. But also, it depends on. Uh, you see, there's another part that I would say. Design needs to be specific. Although you are an international brand, although you are a luxury brand presence in many countries, but if you're designing for a hotel that you are in Asia, in uh, particularly the Asia I'm talking is the Asian of China, the Asian of Macau, the Asian of Hong Kong, where the average person has a typical size, right. you know, uh, you need to be conscious. They also have international traveler, but it could be in a part of China where it's only domestic travelers. So you need to be mindful of uh, of not doing things over proportioned, right? Because it doesn't look right, yeah. and it looks uncomfortable to people. Absolutely. In all fairness, yeah. so there needs to be that kind of intelligence from the people dressing and design the storytelling and and the overall positioning to say where are we and what what we're trying to achieve in here, as opposed to. Cookie cutting the yeah, same everywhere. Yeah, and I think this is what I was trying to hint at, that we've evolved so much that it really, we have to be looking at it from what makes sense, financial sense clearly, but what makes sense, yeah. rather than having a checklist that we're, we're trying just to match. Exactly. And as you just said, I mean, an Excel that we're trying to populate. I think, you know, today, uh, it's pretty much obvious what are industry standards, what are safety standards. Very much. And from that point onward, it is really about delivering a product that is clean, that is safe, that is quite fashionable, and yes. fashion can take different words and terms, design, right? Yes. But more importantly, in a competitive market where it's becoming even more expensive to build and operate, how can we smartly deliver, at least from that point of view, which is the FFNE and eventually the OSNE? And I think this is really what is now key to a lot of the projects going back to you know how we started why did we come together or that collaboration or how is it even relevant and useful today more than ever is really the sensitivity that you can do in saving in how much you spent versus how much more you can get the asset to give you in terms Very of much. inflows right so i think it's that's probably where a lot of work now should be focused rather than brushing it out. And I mean, oftentimes with these sensitivities, I'll be very transparent with you, Filippo, with the studies that we do, it's not so much anymore a question of can we achieve more in Ibiza? Because I think everyone around the room agrees, whether it's the operator, the consultant, the client, other, uh, other qualified people to give an opinion. Everyone pretty much understands what a 200 room hotel can deliver in terms of Ibiza. The real question is at what cost? And, Absolutely. And that's on new projects, but there could be, and we should perhaps also try to touch a little bit about the differences in proposed projects, yes. or at least a number of projects that at the moment either are being converted or that are being upgraded and refurbished as to how much do you can you afford to spend? 
There is a very uh, critical element, and um, and uh, it, and I go back to one point, which is uh, is an interesting how there is such a direct correlation between the effort you put in at the very beginning to produce a feasibility study that all the element of the study go, go down to the financials. What is a market, macroeconomics, demand and supply, but eventually they all capture in the numbers. And, and people always go to the last page and look at the numbers. And the same is with us. They only talk about production. How about you need to produce in this timing? And they always yeah. said, the most difficult part for me as a manufacturer is not the production. Once the production is done, it's actually the preparation. Yeah. Is how do I get to that production? Is the preparation. Do you have all the material control sample? Do you have your BOQ, the quantities? Do you know exactly what you've been designed? Is the material available? Is the fabric available? It's been discontinued. Why? Because you might be delayed for a month. So that month of extra bank interest and that, what's the effect on your IRR? Money, absolutely. It's a big thing. They don't think that now we are in execution phases. But it's the same process. The, the same as you do a feasibility study, it should be done exactly the same on the execution part. It's the preparation mm -hmm. that leads to the output. In your case, it's the number, the return on investment. They wrap up that. And in my case is, we are ready to produce. So the engineering part, as they call it, but it compass everything. And, and this is the most misunderstood part right. and the part that breaks the parameter you set at the very beginning. So, and, and going back to the existing property, on the existing property, uh, uh, and then it also touches upon on the, um, or say on investment decisions when you buy asset or portfolio right. of asset. CAPEX is the part that is the least studied, the least investigated. They get a QS, QS put the user number, but the number are super inflated on certain area, particularly my area. Because again, they try to put benchmark on an existing product. You can do a benchmark on a greenfield project, on a new build because you set the parameters right. and then the design is the bridge of uh, between my world and the investment parameters. But in existing property, the design element is done. Right. The spaces are here. Yeah. You can modify them, you can change the look and feel. So the first question is, do we need to rip everything apart or can we reutilize some of the elements? Yeah. Does it make sense with the new positioning? So in the two processes, what is the real cost of replacing these things? And, uh, and what is the effect on your return investment, on your right. valuation? Or on the valuation. On that point. So nobody does this exercise because they try to have uh, yeah. gone with Just the wind. Just plug in a number. Yeah, plug a number and then we get, and then eventually, oh my God, but I don't get my average rate. <laughs> yeah. That's driven by the market. You yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, uh, so, and the same is in, uh, you know, it needs to require a, an assessment of your bedroom product. Again, how big yeah. is your space is and how many pieces you have in each space? And what does it make sense to change? Yeah, or how much can you perhaps maintain, right? So that exactly. you can end up with a, with a lower capex, but that yeah. you've actually done a major change or uplift to the property. Is the real problem or you not achieving a right average rate? In some cases, maybe it's the f and product or is the f and selection right. they don't drive people to come to your hotel because you get bored after yeah. two days so when we go and assess property the people say hey how much my f and &E will cost <laughs> you know is yeah we need to go and count the yeah. pieces we need to do an assessment together with an investment advisor and then say hey we think you need to spend x amount of million but then how we have the to effect? come in and say whether if you spend that exactly. amount whether you're going to be getting the value or the IRR that Very is being much. expected. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting because there is such a direct correlation between the two job functions that is, and is the same process in terms of assessing the rigidity and the strictness of assessing the entry part. You know, putting together the data, analyzing the data, understanding all the verticals and dynamics and um, and this is where people don't pay attention. And uh, I, I found that in portfolio uh, acquisitions, capacity is so overinflated. And, yeah. uh, and uh, 
they're probably losing the deal because they're pitching at the wrong uh, buying price. I agree. It's, it's, absolutely. It's, um, I don't know. How right. do you see yeah, it? No, absolutely. And as you said, I mean, it's very property specific as well. You really need to understand the cycle of that property. You, understand, you need to determine what exactly do you need to do, yeah. right? And how do you spend that money? And if you were to spend that money, so I am, I'm with you. I mean, with, with the number of valuations that we do and we do the simulations, I think the approach has been, as you rightly said in the beginning, it's always been looked at. Uh, this is the cost per key. And yes, 10% of that is allocated, not even a number that, you know, it goes with a more of a benchmark. 10% of that is the FFNE. Well, what if it's 5%? What if in reality, it's a 15% of that? And what is the impact? I mean, does that uh, reduce your IRR by two percentage point? Um, but it, in my view, that's an area that will become even more of a focus. And I think, especially with the existing projects that they're looking to remain relevant or to rescope or repurpose, that there will be a, a further expectations around trying to understand the elements of FFNE. Um, as you rightly said, I think most of these projects, when they look at, or at least the renovation projects, they're looking at it in the sense of from scratch, let's get everything out and let's renovate the property. What if you were able to reutilize? And I think earlier on also, Filippo, you spoke about something which is very relevant now to the industry, right? The sustainability and how we're approaching, uh, you know, the long-term uh, trends in the hospitality industry. What are we actually doing about them as we renovate these projects or as we develop these projects, especially as it relates to FFNE? The scary part of um, what I'm seeing in renovation is the following. And I have a lot of clients that come and say, what, what kind of warranty do you give with your FFNE? Yeah. And I always say to them, look, we can go for one to five years right. for manufacturing Depending defect. On, yeah. But then some of them insist, I want 10 years. But why do you need 10 years that after seven, you're throwing everything away? Right. So my question is... And you oftentimes know, these are even depreciated at five or seven years, right? Exactly. So it's almost useless. And uh, so they insist, the procurement team insists in, uh, in having certain, which is a cost, because for me to give an extra warranty, I need to charge you. But I shouldn't be charging you because the chair is built to last. The table is built to last. You know, and during the course of an economic cycle, whether it's seven or ten years, you should have amortized this and pay right, back absolutely. and get your money back. Yeah. But you will go back if you stick to what the number says at the very beginning from your feasibility study and you try to lead the execution part to follow those guidelines, those investment parameters, there should be no surprises after. So that, that, that is the critical point. And uh, what they do about sustainability, absolutely nothing. Because as I said before, if a typical procurement process, the real estate developer entertain, whether it's internal, whether through a procurement agency, entails having 28 suppliers, 14 countries, seven time zones, which is a typical 200 bedroom upper upscale hotel kind of procurement, you know, lined up, call it. Already your carbon emissions, you know, is out of the, the roof. So uh, I, I think that is a proof that A, not understanding the process, they are not able to contribute to the sustainability in the pragmatic, in the real fact. Right. No utilizing a, some of the product that they have, which a good product lasts for many years, mm. you know, and, uh, um, and there is no need for replacing. May you need to reupholster, you need to polish, change the top, you know, you need to be creative with that because again, is it necessary? Some of the sweet product of our hotel, they are used very little. And uh, so why do you need to refurbish a suite? Right. Refurbish yeah. the standard Absolutely. product, which is the, the cutlery that goes the most. There is no logic in approaching uh, renovation or reposition. It's just, oh, this is what has normally been done. Let's and do it. Yeah. For me as a manufacturer, thank you very much. I have a that big order. That means bigger business for you. Yeah, Absolutely. But from an investment point of view, it makes uh, yeah. no sense. You know, and, and, and this is where I think the collaboration that we have together just proves that it's doing the right things. It's a big saving, ultimately. Yeah, and, uh, and big uh, return on investment. Yeah. This is where it goes down. And uh, so it, it's the key of, of giving the real advice that more 
practical advice, because again, it's the practicality of an advice yeah. that fails to deliver the, the expected return on investment. Because on a new build, we have a design element in the middle. Right. It's not the design community, it's the design in itself. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody wants to maximize the envelope. In an existing property is looking at the refurbishment more from an investment point of view, as yeah. opposed to, oh, I need to change the look. Again. But that's why I continue to think, and I always uh, had put this forward, that you, know, you can have as many consultants. It's not about having the consultants. It's about having the right consultants with the experience that you actually understand the dynamics. Of course. Right? I think with this conversation, you could tell we've spent years really understanding how hotel functions, the wear and tear of hotels, what makes an asset, what breaks the feasibility study. And I think this is where the danger of also just going with consultants as in a checklist, we need all these consultants on board versus going with consultants that have the experience, right? So you're sitting here today working and executing on projects, Filippo. Yes. You're not looking at it from miles away and likewise i'm you know i do this day in day out we look at projects that are failing and we are looking at projects that are succeeding and we know what makes it fail whether it is from an operation stand view or from an investment stand view and i think that experience supported by the data which you you've been compiling and building together and we clearly have massive databases of projects that are either have been executed or are already established with the experience is where we can sit at the table and really what I would call is pass on an unbiased opinion about what needs to be done and how do we get the maximum value or maximum results or return on investment on projects. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and again, it's, it's highlighting one fact that why HVS, why would couture? Because if we look at the history and the tangible evidence, not the opinion, right. is that you do hundreds and thousands and valuations each year. So you see the real numbers, not the benchmark. What really people really achieve with that kind of asset in their Correct. location, with that kind of operation and so forth. And we see the real numbers because we're making it for these brands. And, and, and there is no better evidence and better advice that can come from the real things. Right, absolutely. You know, and so this is that's the first That's what the numbers point. are saying. That's Very not a, an opinion. That's True. what actually the numbers are saying, right? This, this is exactly that. This is exactly what happened the day after, as I call it. The second point is this one, that in your case, you've done enough advisory to see a project from the paper to the operation, to the refurbishment. So you see all the life cycles and the effect of the evolution of the market. Including asset different. management and asset optimization, which oftentimes exactly. has an element of capex, right? Because Indeed. you're either re renovating or you're uh, adding a, an F&B outlet or you're changing a certain uh, areas in a project, yeah. And, and, and then, uh, you know, Every year we execute multiple projects worldwide, not just in this region. And we quote about 180 to 210 projects worldwide. So we see specifications, the type of interior designer from the star architect to the one man band. You see how many pieces they put in each brand, the kind of position, the storytelling, the material mm -hmm. that they specify. And, and you understand exactly from that what could be the potential problems, the challenges that poses to the execution of the project, the completion of the project, and then eventually goes back yeah. to the initial part, which is the Absolutely. return on investment. Time delay, cost overrun, you know, product that don't even fit that kind of brand, you know, and, uh, and uh, we see that one too. You know, a lot of the people want a Ferrari for the price of a BMW, and uh, I'm afraid when you start looking at what it costs, then you realize yeah. you spend nine months designing. And again, it's not the problem of designers. Designers are creatives, they're storytellers. Right. They create a story by the, by, with images and design. But, but then the they will never know how much it costs this. Yeah, absolutely. You can never get feeling if you're yeah. an experienced designer. You know, you but can walk in a hotel and That's what I always say, you know, everything on paper looks very sexy and nice, yeah. right? I mean, you know, you make True. it glossy, you make it look good, but it is quite different than 
when you actually start executing. True. Yeah. And on the other hand, particularly in the ultra luxury space, um, uh, what people underestimate is the following, and uh, that the frequent traveler, the used to go in the most sophisticated places, particularly at the luxury level, mm -hmm. understand quality better than a designer because they try it all the time. The designer also, they travel there, but these travelers, they go for business, for right. pleasure, so they try the product. They know exactly whether it is a quality product Absolutely. or is you yeah. know, a cheap attempt. And, and that what makes a breaks, you know, I mean, kind of what I believe is the repeat visitations, you know, yeah. and, and uh, those are the real judges, you know, whether they're going to eventually book with your hotel or not. And, uh, and, and, and some of the product that has been, you know, specified for this kind of asset makes no sense whatsoever mm -hmm. at that pitch level. And, uh, you know, it's, um, again, you can have a Ferrari for a price of BMW because it's not a Ferrari. True. You know, it will never be a Ferrari. It may look like, but when you try but, yeah, to say, it doesn't, it doesn't drive. You know the it difference, yeah. Exactly. So, it, 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 I think the, the benefit for anybody entertaining, having people like us, you and us, working on their project is to have a very practical and realistic outcome. Absolutely. As opposed to... An opinion. You know. That's exactly. what I always say. There's a difference between <laughs> an opinion, an opinion exactly. right? And knowing, actually, yeah. because, yeah, because a, you have the hard it's facts. It's very much. It's a yeah. Clear facts, yeah. clear expertise that, you know, uh, if executed, is achievable. It's executed in the proper way. It's not just, okay, what are we doing next? No, no. There is a clear yeah. methodology how to go about things. And uh, that's it. So, Filippo, we've come a long way in the last 15 years. Very much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking very it's 2000, far. very far. <laughs> very far. Who knows, maybe in 15 years we'll be addressing other challenges. And we would have. I